themes that were discussed um, in the first session, um, it wasn't planned. Um, but via slightly different lenses, um, so to speak, um, this session's called Exposures, and it'll explore the realm of public and private exposure, as well as the context in which images move between the spaces of documentation and those of display. With the immense growth of photography in the public sphere, what are some of the leading concerns about privacy in public spaces? <coughs> the session will also reflect upon the dispersion of images through various online forums, and we did um, briefly mention Facebook and Instagram as just two of the most popular forums for this dissemination, um, leading to questions on the ethics of display, the control of images, and also how these different types of spaces in which images circulate and are consumed create challenging situations for reception and perception. Um, I'm going to use a term that um, Laura um, Letinsky, our first speaker, ha um, used in an interview somewhere, which is the image of an image or images of images. I was struck in the first presentation about how, speaking for myself, I was consuming many of, what, uh, of the photographs that we were seeing via the images, especially in Eileen's uh, presentation, it was, uh, for instance, that image of the hoarding when it was lying behind a fence was an image in itself. It wasn't just a photograph of a photograph. And uh, continuing with this idea of the image of an image, um, I'd like to consider the value of images, a value that is created and also dissipated between the moment of its making to that of its viewing and its consumption. Um, how do we locate this value of a photographic image? Because it's no longer you know, in the older fraught claims to truth which is untenable. Is the value of a photograph located in its image or in its objectness, which is then circulated and consumed in various ways, um, or in its aesthetic value? And indeed, one of the panelists um, today, uh, Francois, will also question how the idea of an aesthetic value is arrived at. When does an image become art? When is it an object of beauty? Um, when do images get relegated to the sphere of being raw material to be used by artists with a particular intention and then become objects of beauty and art um, and circulate in very different uh, sort of modes of consumption? And should we be thinking then of intention and consensus as two very key um, ideas in this process of making and consumption? This panel will also address the slippages that occur in the meaning and reception of images in the spaces of the production, display, and dissemination. And all of this within the changed technological conditions of both making and viewing that are available to us today. Um, we also hope to reframe the question of staging itself, again, in the construction of the images, but also in the light of the recent proliferation of photo festivals um, in South Asia itself, and just to name very few, there are photo festivals in Delhi, Jaipur, Goa, Pondicherry, Kathmandu, and Bombay, amongst others. Um, they have recently uh, taken on a sort of homogenized format, uh, much like the Art Biennale, coming around every two years. Um, there is a preference for utilizing public spaces along with institutions. And again, I'd like to underline the nature of spectatorship, which is often related to the making of a spectacle. A certain sort of flatness makes the aesthetic of the photo festival today. In public spaces, images, quite often portraits, which are shot in close-up, are scaled up, often to the size of buildings, and indeed often actually uh, displayed on the roofs of buildings, on the sides of buildings. And um, one of the most effective ways then of viewing these images are through images of these images, which make for the sort of best uh, and most spectacular conditions um, for these photo festivals to exist in. Mm. I would also like to um, perhaps bring up the question of uh, the placement of these images in readily available publics. What is the nature of uh, the spaces in which the images are made, the subjects, the position of the author, so to speak, and the viewer who is viewing them? And in this comes in the question of annotation, notation, context, something that Madhushri will be speaking about, but in the nature of, in the context of an archive. Um, and I'd like to end my very brief introduction with three somewhat related provocations. Um, the first is a quote by Gregory Halpern from On Documentary Ethics, a Preoccupation, Subjectivity, and Untruths. He writes, I once saw a handbook made for doctors working in combat zones. The book contained gruesome photographs of badly wounded bodies. 
The photographs illustrated how to perform surgery, amputate, cauterize, etc. while in the field. It's the best book on war I've ever seen. The images on the cover of the New York Times during the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan were, by contrast, so gorgeous, so romantic. They were artfully composed and beautifully lit, sometimes even taken in the golden hour, and were some of the most lovely images I'd ever seen in the Times. I was troubled by these sunset postcards from the front. I was troubled by the wars we were fighting, and I felt that the images from the war ought to be troubling as well, that they ought to contain a degree of terror, in fact. I was shocked that the Times was running such pleasing, tasteful images to report on the war. Alas, it was, and it is, hard times for journalism and photojournalism, and dismembered bodies don't sell papers. Um, the second image, um, which I'm sure most of the audience here will know, is, was made in 2016 um, by Rohit Chavla, a photo, I, I think, the head of the visual um, department at India Today, one of the leading uh, weekly news magazines in the country. Um, the word viral, and this image has gone viral, as did the image that uh, inspired it, um, and I, think, I, I don't think any other word can be used. Um, and it's more commonly understood now, viral, in the context of the circulation, and, the, and virality is now an aspired to condition. Um, recently in July, I was at a workshop at the Tate Modern, and um, one of the comments, uh, visitors' feedback, which is really, really important, especially in public institutions, uh, one of the visitors wrote that there weren't enough opportunities for Instagram in the exhibitions. And at a later seminar, one of the curators at Off the Date Modern then spoke of how that is something that they keep in mind very often in terms of creating enough Instagrammable opportunities in the exhibitions, in the displays, in the art that is shown at the museum. Um, well, Ai Weiwei's Instagram account um, was uh, full of images in 2015 and 16 um, when he was posting images from the Greek island of Lesbos. Um, soon after, a photo of him posed as Alan Kurdi, a Syrian toddler whose lifeless body head to the sand was photographed near Bodrum in Turkey. Um, him posed as that appeared in the September 2015 issue of India Today. And the photographer was displayed um, in what was called a tribute to the dead child and in solidarity with the refugee crisis. Um, Roy Chavla, the photographer who shot this image, and um, there were features and features, and uh, you can see a video about how the image was constructed as well, um, was quoted as saying that the artist actively helped in staging this photograph for us. And he also says, I'm sure it wasn't comfortable to lie down in the pebbles like that, but the soft evening light fell on Ai Weiwei's face as he lay down. The third image I have here is uh, from an exhibition um, made by Richard Prince. Um, this is, uh, uh, it was shown first at the Gagosian in Los Angeles in 2014 and at the Fries New York Art Fair in 2015. Um, and there are 38 photographs um, that Richard Prince made um, and the series was called uh, New Portraits. And each of these prints reportedly sold for more than $90,000. Well, these photographs themselves were screenshots of images that Prince took from his Instagram feed. He enlarged them and printed them on canvas. These were photos of models, artists, and other celebrities. Um, and this is a term that the Daily Mail uses in re reporting uh, this exhibition. Um, and each image included a comment made by Richard Prince with his Instagram handle at the bottom of... Um, the canvas. And interestingly, the copyright laws that Prince bypassed apparently were that he removed the original Instagram captions, replacing them with his own text. There was nothing else that he had uh, violated in terms of ownership, copyright laws, authorship. And on the other hand, it has also been suggested that since he added his own text, that makes these, each of these, an artwork and his own um, you know, original work of art, so an image of an image. Um, I'll leave you with this, and I'd like to invite Laura Litinsky first, um, followed by Madhusri, and then Prasua. Thank you. First, I'd like to say thank you um, for inviting me today. I really appreciate being here and being involved in this event. 
So I'm going to start by showing this image. And I wanted to keep with the subject of today's talk, thinking about um, the kinds of questions that are being asked. And the first thing that came to me is I set on this question was where to start, how to define a medium <coughs> whose use has had such a profound impact on our world. As material and in etymology, the word photography, of course, comes from the Greek root genitive of phos, light, and graphe, which is um, a representation by the means of lines or drawing, together meaning drawing with light. Even as we define the photograph as a material medium, its, medi its meaning, though, is not so easily containable. What the photograph means depends on what is drawn or pictured, who does the picturing, not to mention who does the looking and in what context. All of these affect what is the photograph. And by way of further addressing this question today, I'll be showing my work. This is a screenshot using the term photograph. In an era when on average, and this is actually 2013, so I'm behind on the statistic, 350 million photographs are uploaded daily to Facebook. That's not including Instagram or Tumblr or any of these other image sites. What could there possibly still be that needs to be photographed? Why do we continue to make them? And why do we continue to look at them? Again, I ask, what is a photograph? I'm going to propose that we address this question by turning to its function, that is, its use, and how do we use photography. In a little bit of intellectual acrobatics, I turn to the theorist Judith Butler for her work on ide gender and identity. In her groundbreaking book, Bodies That Matter, she theorizes that gender is neither predetermined biologically, nor is it completely constructed. Rather, the characteristics associated with male and female are a conjunction of these factors, not necessarily in binary opposition, and that determinations of gender are dependent upon an ongoing and myriad set of factors. One isn't inherently X. Rather, we ascertain who somebody is by what they do, by their performance of self. Her ideas of performativity traces back to that of the linguist theorist Ferdinand Saussure. His ideas were pivotal to much of our structuralist and post-structuralist understanding of language as it relates to the social and the psychological. Words do not have inherent meaning, rather they are agreed upon signs. We as a society can agree that when I say the word photograph, we all have some shared idea of what that means. A sign points to its referent. He also theorized that words can do things just by being uttered. He used the words, or the example of I do, to epitomize how in marriage vows, by saying those words, the individuals are forever transformed, the man becomes husband, and the woman becomes wife. The performance of these words has actualized a different understanding of those who bespoke them. They've activated a change in the world through being uttered. For the sake of time and for my argument, I'm not going to go deeply into her sophisticated discussion of gender as performance, other than to underline that gender, or more broadly identity, or the determination of meaning is not concrete. And as, um, just as a man is not X as determined by his biology or his genetic characteristics, gender is a negotiation of that biological he, just as much as it is socially determined set of conditions. And as such, it's always shifting as society shifts, wearing heels, makeup, talking in falsetto, or no more characteristics of female. Um, just as fantasizing about murder is not the same thing as being a murder. Um, being nice is an innate quality. Rather, it's one action, one's actions in the world that define one as such. If identity is dependent upon how it is performed and acted in the world, then how might we consider how the photograph is used as what it means or what it is. So again, let's start with its material. It's a light-sensitive material, but what does that tell us? As Roland Barth wrote in his stern critique of the 1950s exhibition, The Family of Man, in his mythologies text, birth, death, joy, suffering, all of this happens, yes, but the conditions for its occurrence, as well as what and how it means, are dependent not only upon material facts, but upon the context in which it is framed. And I'm quoting gender, um, I'm quoting Judith Butler here, gender reality is performative, which means that it is real only to the extent that it is performed. Just as what we see here is obviously an advertisement for cars, but we don't see the car. Rather, we see an image that's designed to sell a bounty that would be availed to us with the car. And not only that, but the use of bodies to sell ice cream, of course. 
determine the conditions that in addition to wanting what we see, these advertisements see or picture what we want. So what are these photographs performing? What do we perform at their bequest? Certainly photography and capitalism had made, have made very cozy bedfellows. And it's an understatement to say that one of the primary uses of photography is to sell. So what is being sold to us here? I want to speak to the historical use of proselytization. And I also want to point out how we might ask the question of art. What does art sell, particularly as photography has become enmeshed within this marketplace? And here I have um, Andreas Gursky's Rhine II from 1999, which was hold, held the record um, at one point as the most expensive photograph ever sold for 4.3 million US dollars. The image is a composite. It's a combination of several exposures and digital intervention. And one might find this a paradox, that this depiction of the Rhine cannot be obtained you know, in one single exposure. Rather, a fictitious construction is required to make a so-called accurate image. And indeed, the photograph um, was described as being you know, so real, it really gave you the impression of the Rhine. So that it fulfills an idea about what a river or this river looks like that that can only be realized through a skilled technological manipulation of media so as to give us this feeling of real. More real than real, mighty real. The simulacra, more real than what? Than the experience? And what is the experience of the river as compared to the experience of the photograph? And I want to ask how many of you, for example, Instagram the meal you ate last night? Or more terrifying, thinking about the recent case of a woman who, while being raped, was shown and made to re replicate pornographic image that was on the screen. Sex and food being so much better when mediated by the image and the device. Photographs show us what we want, and they're used to teach us. So what are we learning here through the politics of an image such as this? Um, photographs taken on a telephone made by US soldiers at Abu Ghraib. The pictures were taken, and then with the ease of pressing a button, almost unconsciously, widely and wildly disseminated. With these things that we call phones, but we use to avoid actually speaking to one another, we use for making pictures and then <coughs> sending these images, almost like blinking, seemingly natural, automatic, and unmaterial, or material only as electro electric diodes on the screen. An image like this has obvious political implications, as does so much of documentary photography. And what of the pictures of women who, through their picturing, come to define what is beauty while simultaneously setting up the longing and desire for everything they offer, including the objects which they hawk? To paraphrase Gertrude Stein, is there a there there? Or Baudrillard, a European awed by Los Angeles, who, building on the structuralist ideology of Saussure, moving into a post-structuralist assertion, is there any relation between the sign and what it points to? For these soldiers, the photographs had a very different set of meanings than for those of us who saw it, the photographs in the US or here, or those in the prison. Not to mention other varieties of geographies, religions, and power dynamics. If on the one hand, we are in a period where everyone is a photographer and everything's been pictured, why more pictures? What's its ongoing allure? What do they reveal? And is it a revelation or is it a repetition? I'm going to try to turn to my work. I'm going to turn to my work now to try and address, at least in part, this quandary. This is a photograph um, from the first series of work that I did back in the mid 90s called Venus Inferred. And from the very early days of making pictures, I've always been really invested in the negotiation between the personal and the public that we have these supposed dichotomies between what we think of as personal, like love, yet at the same time, the very, um, the very entity that we call love is so highly mediated and so programmed, and we are so subject to its programming that, for example, when one hears, when one feels love, you think of it as being, or I think of it as being idiosyncratic and special and individual. And yet, of course, when there's a pop song that I really, really love, I think, oh, that's exactly, you know, those words are expressing exactly how I feel. So what is this relationship between something that's on the one hand seemingly innate and natural, and yet we're taught so much about how to experience those emotions through the plethora of, of mediation? And I was really interested in this work to think about voyeurism and looking as pleasure 
precisely because of the danger that I saw that aligned the religious right conservatives with um, the anti-pornography rhetoric of feminism, um, 70s feminism, not to mention Plato's admonitions um, that looking is a kind of pleasure that's theatrical and not real. But what is that thing about looking that is like so yummy and so seductive? I photograph friends, friends of friends, and also myself, understanding these not as portraits, but as stories and like fictions and like all stories that they teach us something. And looking at the pedagogy of images and how through the Enlightenment ideology, moving from a sacred to a secular discussion, paintings such as this Mantegna's, uh, Renaissance painting Mantegna's Deposition of Christ, how to picture is a set of lessons that get passed on from pre precedents. And that everything that happened in photography happened prior in other picturing modes. In this series of romance or love that I was making, I was particularly interested in um, Renaissance painting and the way that religious painting set up formulations and formula for how to see and how to picture emotions and this notion of love as identified as male or female and how it shapes our needs and wants. And yet I was also frustrated by the uh, photograph as a kind of impossibility that it never really delivered on what it promised. So this is the final photograph that I made in the series. Um, and I shifted at this point to being less interested in the people and much more interested in the space because of the way that the love story in the photograph seemed to both collapse in a kind of inevitable failure with the promise that was held in, that's held in romance and the promise that's held in the photograph as a kind of uncompromised present, an impossible space to be except for in regret hindsight or in longing and desire. So what happens to the remnant of a story? What, is, what are you left with? So I started doing a series in 1997 on the still life, still thinking about the intimate space of the home as a space that is, again, we all know what home means to us as individuals. And yet, if it was such an innate place or space or entity, there wouldn't be all of the cultural, social production around the home. Everything from in the US, Martha Stewart, to cooking shows, to how to make your house, to how to be a good wife, to how to be a good homemaker, how to design your space. And so I started thinking about the home as um, a place to think about this negotiation. And the still life also in terms of what kind of importance it could hold for us. And why at particular moments, the still life seems to be so such an important vehicle for thinking about the home. Again, using um, pictorial precedents, looking to the 17th century Northern Europe as a space and a time where the still life gained a great deal of prominence. And Norman Bryson uh, wrote a fantastic book called Looking at the Overlooked, where he talks about how um, still life communicates about the culture that produces the still life. Because it talks about what the value of the still life is. And in this particular case, it was an early global materialist capitalist culture that valued objects, but not only objects, it valued the description of objects. It was one thing for these early, this early globalized culture to go out and sail around the world and bring back these objects that were foreign and exotic and of value. It was one thing to have those objects, but there was an imperative to picture these objects, and then not only to picture these objects, but to widely disseminate these objects, these paintings of these objects. Because it served as a kind of ownership and a kind of advertisement of one's status. It meant a kind of knowledge, a kind of foray into a bourgeois culture that then set up the ideas of what it is to have access to these material goods. And that a pleasure in material objects is certainly one trajectory of the allegory that's described in these paintings. The other is the meager repast. But there are really lessons in how to see and how to think and how to understand one's relation to the world and the placement of value. So this painting is geminated within a Northern European sensibility and as such reflects a Protestant set of ideologies and aesthetics that Svetlana Alpers defines in counterdistinction to the Southern Catholic tradition. That is, in the North, there's a democracy of description because it's mercantile culture that was also Protestant demanded an egalitarian description with the idea that God made everything, so everything was deserving of equal attention. 
but also this widespread dissemination of imagery as the means to articulate its set of values, which was different than the Southern tradition. The Albertian mode of description, as shown here, this is a, a etching by Durer describing the Albertian mode of description, was fully articulated in the Renaissance with and also picked up with the camera's monocular single eye that replicates this perspectival system while also meeting the needs for verisimilitude. It's a way of seeing and describing what we see as well as an ability to reproduce infinitely. Photography is less invention than a realization of a set of demands. So this draftsman making a perspective line drawing of a woman illustrates Alberti's perspectival principles. Do I need to mention that it also depicts a pretty specific gender relationship of the seer and who is seen? As Laura Mulvey's 1976 essay on, on, on narrative cinema and visual pleasure sets forth an argument that I radically simplify, the camera's gaze occupies resolutely a position of authority. Housed within the social, its gaze is ruled by hegemony, so that the, sorry, hegemony, so that the female is always positioned as object, subjected to and by the male. This power relationship is also a perpetuation of social attitudes. It's not proof, but rather it's like language. Through repetition, it's normalized. The more you read, hear, and see something, the more it's naturally so. And so in my series, Venus Inferred, The Couples Project, I was really interested in how this position aligned with problems and ideas of prohibition about looking and that pleasure and the, the desire that's set up in the photograph. And as I continued with the Still Life Project, I tried to think about the quotidian and the idea of looking closely, of slowing down time, of really looking at what was around me, and with the project of what it means to make a home, with cooking and eating, with hunger and satiation, as metaphors for seeing, with the implications and connotations that are um, potent in those, those analogies. <coughs> I was also and remain really interested in perception, not as a natural or a passive act, rather that seeing is active and relative and thus um, a performative activity, as are the judgments and determinations that are drawn from sub such observations. As I continued with this project, again, the notion of the home as innate um, fell away and I became very, very conscious of the production of these images. Um, and the experience, the relationship to advertising, to um, all the stores and the advertisements that depict for us what home should be, and the labor of production, and the gendering of that labor of production. I wanted there to be an understanding of the home, a kind of investigation of the space as what you put into it. This is from a slightly different series of images. And I'm gonna move quickly um, here to, um, through some work to get to my final series here. Uh, because I've been given a little nudge. Um, what became really important to me as I was working was the, the imperative to think about materiality and the encounter with the photograph as a material object. And as part of this, I did a series of ceramics that were also um, in, read, uh, available for um, use. They're not thought of as art objects. And um, working on the making photographs on the digital scanner, this is a smaller series of images, to a project called Stain, which I will talk about at some other more casual point, that looked at um, uh, the questioning of white as a ideal and as a politic, but making napkins that have a stain that's woven into them that is for use in home. Two photographs that I made um, actually while I was here in India in 2014 that I'm working on a collaborator with a series of weavings, turning them into jacquard weavings that are interpretations and we're calling the series Telephone Game. Um, and I wanna talk more briefly uh, before we close here about after sort of going through these different um, material investigations of how to make the photograph in the world and to have it um, have a material presence, to have it ha have an encounter with the image rather than it being something that you encounter on a screen. I started making these works, um, this is 2010, where I started culling from the image archives that exist in the world, from the magazine and advertisement culture to create these scenes that are still lifes but are made from images that already exist. And really it's a way of thinking about what the picture is by using photographs and as a way of thinking about 
how the photograph sets up a desire for what you see that's again this impossible desire because it can never be satiated but here there's a kind of punning or a slippage between what it is one might desire by looking at the photograph is the photograph itself and so there's a kind of circuitry of production and consumption that is um, really important to me but also and I want to close on this um, as I just move through here quickly also just a real pleasure in the image and in the encounter. And I mean less a pleasure in the image as you see it here as a reproduction, but the photographs themselves have a really um, strong material presence. They're printed on Hannah Mule paper. They are um, printed so that there's a physical encounter, a physical relationship to the image and a kind of engagement that again um, demands, or I hope invites, be, be my aspiration, that invites a kind of contemplation and uh, a temporal narrative engagement with um, being with the image for that time, rather than the rapidity of the Instagram image or of the thing that you see on the screen right now. And I'll close on that. Thank you. Hi. Uh, one disclaimer to begin with, uh, a major one. I'm not a practicing photo artist neither am I image theorist. I think I'm here more on a ticket of um, affection from uh, Latika, which is cultivated in a completely different context. So she, she decided that I should speak here. I'm a documentary filmmaker, and my relationship with photographs is lensed through my engagement with documentary practices or documentary materiality. So, uh, that very specific kind of engagement that takes me to the complex issue of annotation, because um, uh, in that practice, you look uh, at a photograph as uh, possible material uh, on a running narrative, which is not necessarily the photograph itself. So photograph is, is more of an ingredient for a running, in a running narrative. I mean, that is the way I'm trying to look at photographs. So that means reading a photograph is very important than the production of the photograph. So the reading of a photograph, what kind of background material needs to be accessed in order to read a photograph is my area of concern. Hence my presentation will be on the relationship between the image and annotation, text and context, and body and space. I shall present two completely different sets of very well-known images. Uh, it's, it's production process has nothing to do with me. I don't even know the people uh, um, well uh, who had um, produced those images. The first one is Mary Allen Marks' compilation of images of sex workers in a book titled Falkland Road. Many of you may have already seen this. Uh, for the um, longest time, it was only available in, in a very expensive and rarely available book, but now they are all over. Uh, wave. She vis visited uh, the red light area of Bombay in 1977, lived in the vicinity for a few months, painstakingly befriended the sex workers. With that uh, process of befriending the sex workers is almost a uh, folklore now, and made their portraits. The red light area is situated in Falkland Road, and thus the compilation is titled as Falkland Road. So what is obvious that they are, when we were reading, we are seeing these photos now, there are a few feminist interventions which belong to the time when these photographs were taken, that is 70s, in the theory of viewing, in the theory of making image, Mark is practicing very, very rigorously. It's almost like a handbook of uh, 70s uh, feminist theory on image making. So very quickly, what are those, in my opinion, is the images are not voyeuristic. We are not stealing a glance at them when they were not our. In fact, it is the other way around. The girls are looking straight at us, daring us to look at them. They are not coy, nor are they absent-minded. But what does this informed choice mean? How does that informed choice annotate the images when we see them at another time and space? B. The images are foregrounding a section of people who have not been represented so far. This can be called uh, action against tyranny of invisibility, an evocative term coined by Linda Need in Female Nude, Art, Obscenity, and Sexuality, 70s. 
see, the images show a person, not a category such as young bidder, woman with apple, etc., the heritage of great uh, art practices of earlier century. It shows very definitely an underage girl from a poor background who is engaged in commercial sex work in India. I mean, the syntax, I'm making this syntax very deliberately. An underage girl from a poor background who is engaged in commercial sex work in India. D. Instead of sensuousness, the images are intended to create a sense of empathy. Towards that end, the most important factor is that the images are documentary and thus real and not mediated. Unlike the image, um, uh, first image uh, of this iconic image of uh, Renoir, uh, dated 1904, the American feminist documentary image maker in 1977 was centrally interested in the hardship of her protagonist's lives. For her, those bodies are essentially social bodies. So these are the images made by somebody who has a very severe critique of earlier image practices. But there are still two other aspects left. First, the body. The girls at Falkland Road, going by the categorization of Vajar, where he tried to make an early articulation between nude uh, as a commodity and naked as a way of being, are they nude or naked? I would argue that they are nude, but nude with certain agency. They are aware of the camera and they have agreed to be photographed and so they have an agency, obviously. But they are also performing the nakedness, albeit with defiance, and the performance makes it a nude image. In a way, these photographs challenge Bajal's definition of naked and nude. What makes these photographs different is their performance for documentary. They are not naked because they are not being their own selves. They are not nude because they are not the bodies that are seen by others in their absent-mindedness. They are naked bodies that are making a practiced and routine performance of nudity for the camera. Is could it have been the reading in the 77 when uh, uh, Mary was making those images, or is it a reading of today? Now their agency come through this very specific performance of the self, very specific and momentary performance of the self, the expression and the posture of defense, which has something to do with the photographer's friendship, special relationship with them. And the second point is about the space, Falkland Road. She frames these women's images with an acute sense of their surrounding, their Special reality. You remember the girl with the green walls, which was really uh, coming on her. Uh, so there is a very accurate awareness of the space that they inhabit. Yet, she does not really map them in broader time and space. I quote from her, the, from, I quote her from the book. Saroja never asked me anything personal. No one did. They wanted to know only my age, why I didn't wear a brazier, and why I wasn't married. I think the reason I was finally accepted was that I was single, alone, alone in the world like they were. One madam told me, we are sisters. You and I are fitted up for the same life. Every night I say my prayers and I sleep alone like you. The sameness found in sleeping pattern cannot make for strategy, cannot make for a strategy in portrait making. In her concentration on the gender affinity with the women, she completely ignores their locations and identities. For the images uh, in the book cover, which is uh, again this, this one, for this image, she writes as her own annotation, which, which, is, not on, uh, uh, which is on the relationship of this girl. Saroja, the madam, has complete control over the girls. The relationship is one of master and slave but also of mother and daughter. The girls wo worship and fear their madam. Putla, who brought her by her mother when she was 12 years old, one night, the 13-year-old Putla, Saruja's youngest girl, allowed a drunken customer to have her for only three rupees. Saruja grabbed her by the hair and pounded her with her fist. Putla didn't utter a sound. The other girl stood by and watched silently. Five minutes after her beating, Putla was ready for walk again. Her face washed and the dress changed. Later that night, I saw Putla embracing Saroja and giving her a back massage. 
happening to me, this annotation has betrayed the girl's agency to perform herself for the camera. That uh, story has nothing to do with this moment when she is practicing an agency. The text about the social reality as a caption for the image has robbed the autonomy of the image. While the models in the European knew the simple material, the subjects of these documentary images are actually performers. And robbing them that agency is a various issue of concern. They are performing the self, a very cultivated performance that the photographer is calling real and wants us to believe so. So then the, the lack of sync between the annotation and, and, and the image becomes very serious. Despite Mark's gender affinity, the very painstakingly cultivated proximity, the vigor, the discursive attention to the method of production, the images could not escape the trap of othering. At a practical level, I would say that it gets demonstrated in Mark's scanty curiosity about the area that is Falkland Road, though the book is called Falkland Road because the brothels are situated in Falkland Road. Now, Falkland Road is the artery road uh, in um, Pila House. That is Playhouse, which is hybridized by the local as a uh, Pila House. It was um, demarcated by the British administration in 1985 as the entertainment district modeled by, uh, modeled on uh, London's uh, Playhouse. And it's interesting that um, Kamatipura, where actually the red light area is within uh, Playhouse, uh, is named after Telugu speaking masons. Uh, who uh, came as migrant construction workers. This red light area had separate, uh, during Second World War, it actually um, really came um, into popularity and it had separate Japanese and Burmese uh, lanes. There, there were also European Jew sex workers and very, it was very, uh, uh, it, uh, the earliest and the most complicated uh, cosmopolitan uh, area of Indian uh, modern urbanity. So there were entertainment tents for kusti, circus, magic, and performances, which later got converted into drama houses and then into cinemas. And those cinemas are still surviving as single screen cinemas. Within the footloose main of the area, sailors of many races from the nearby ports, Asian bazaar vapories, who is to come for a few months, uh, local loaders, uh, menial workers, and performers of many kinds Six workers were as much part of the neighborhood as you can see uh, in this map, where the red uh, um, marks are for the brothel. Uh, so you can see the concentration of uh, six workers are as much as uh, any other uh, livelihood practitioners. And this is the image of Falkland Road now, contemporary Falkland Road, taken two years back. And this is a poster. Uh, for an entertainment show in 1912. And here you can see, I quickly read rates of tickets, reserved stall two lines, three rupees, reserved box two lines, two rupees, box one rupee, eight annas, stalls two lines, one rupee, stalls back lines, 12 annas, ga gallery eight annas, pit four annas, ladies four annas, prostitutes one rupee. So the sex workers are made to pay or um, uh, they were uh, as respected a patron as the adult uh, male, adult male. Now, we can argue over that it means exploitation or it means honor or recognition, but it's interesting that a regular entertainment uh, event in their poster had to recognize and put the sex workers uh, category as a valid patron. So coming from that area and calling the book by that name, uh, these photographs had nothing to do with that area. Uh, and when the photos shows this kind of images like this, she writes, I mean, the uh, photographer writes for this image, Saroja, given the choice, I would have never, I would have rather stayed in my village, but I had stayed there but if I had stayed there, I would never have known what I have missed. For this photograph, she writes, Muntaz and I are best friends. We are sisters. We have exchanged blood. And that's it. Finally, at the last ch chapter, 
she writes without any image saroja and i became closer and closer sometimes i stayed in her house until the lights went out and the all nights customers came in we ordered tea from downstairs and sat and talked once i went to a street fair with her and her girls one night i invited her to a restaurant i wanted to take her someplace special in another part of town but as soon as we arrived i knew i had made a mistake she was overdressed and felt uncomfortable and out of place the only place where saroja really felt relaxed was sitting on her bed in her brothel room and that precisely is my issue mark's decision to avert such an image where the protagonist looks odd she said that saroja was out of place but it could be that the place was uncomfortable with saroja uh, the place was out of saroja that could have been a kind of remapping foregrounding the conflict between the location and the body the absence of falkland road in the book by the same name can be considered as a marker that frames the uh, women only with their interior space comprising misery disease poverty oppression malnutrition and do not make them part of the broader map where some punctures in the social order could have been found it is a queer space it was a early urbanity it was a wild space where these women were situated and um, she was not interested she was not interested in that the the that that other social order that the space was offering so there was a conflict between the body and the space and she was not interested in that conflict in this context and also in the context of professor pollock's um, quote uh, i would like to show you some images which are not, which are not photographs which is of indian painter uh, arpita singh from this city everybody knows her work from this city in today's context a congregation of bodies we immediately pre annotated i mean the state pre annotated in certain ways but we uh, uh, i mean uh, the conscientious uh, citizens we also pre annotated them in a certain way then it extra become extremely difficult if you want to create an archive that do you go by the very technical way or the way it is by being captioned or do you take your pre annotation seriously or do you try to uh, amalgamate them and create a third narrative how do you keep it open the reading at the same time that how do you um how do you take care of um this whole kind of um, pre annotation which can really take us to a very dangerous thing so this is a uh, relatives of detained youth being treated in sanatnagar cooking gas supply it could have been in delhi it could have been in bombay long queue of people can be seen outside bakeries but suddenly these bodies look so so polemical students from sainik school sainik school <laughs> were admitted to the hospital after eating adulterated food yeah this is a daily newspaper is a daily urdu newspaper with a circulation of 5000 these are news for them a busy street nearby some school security forces removed all hawkers forcibly from lal chowk but this is also cleansing uh, that ha- that is happening in all metropolises so all other metropolitan concerns are also that lands concerns which uh, are difficult to fathom today bazaar in early 90s preparation for uh, idul adha okay so many bakris um, uh, i should have been created very serious <laughs> problem today heavy rainfall a uh, uh, snowfall and it has its own issue of migration so this caption in the daily newspaper for this image is migrant beggars on the street obstruct the passage of wayfarers so they they have their own othering everybody has their own othering and this image which uh came to us quite by chance and what it is it is actually for somebody's obituary this woman had died and there is no other photo than this for her so this photo came to take her uh, the instruction was that only take her image and put it on her obituary and a very simple uh, um, as in the first session we saw the images of desire studio photographs and who, uh, interior studio photographs of an youth which when it appears in the newspaper it comes as martyr majid so but it comes with the caption that he, um, um, uh, he is a martyr mujahideen 
So when it co- comes as a martyr and mujahideen, then a young man's um, of, um, of self um, of, um, uh, portrait, uh, um, uh, which 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 is very common and which has been studied a lot about uh, uh, aspiration and desire, suddenly become get another meaning. So the, what I'm going to say is there are always uh, lots of. Um, sync issues between uh, annotation, captions, text, body, context. Um, if the image, in the images of women in Falkland Road, the location, location is made redundant in order to foreground the bodies, and the bodies are annotated to fit them within the narrative strategy of the then dominant documentary trend in sociology. In the newspaper photographs of Kashmir, the contemporary perception of the location overwhelms our reading of the uh, bodies. In some sense, they get pre-annotated. The captions or annotations here are struggling against the trend of templating the location in contemporary terms. Now, I will just run a series of images now. This is a personal archive of public reality. It, this is actually a funeral path. Uh, some people here have already seen these images. Uh, Abdul Ghani Lone witnessed many young men who joined the movement for Azadi getting killed by the martyrs, uh, by the by the uh, military, or even by the militants. He called all of them martyrs. Many of them were from other parts of Kashmir, uh, hiding um, in that region, and their identities could not be determined, or the Indian state was not interested in their identities and so their families were not informed about their death. So he tried to build an archive, but he was not a photographer, nor was he an uh, archivist. He documented whatever uh, information he could gather about these boys, sometimes even a passport-sized photograph. Then he shot with his very cheap, you know, those days, those uh, hot shot cameras. He shot the path of their funeral processions. He could not have shot the funeral, as the Indian army would not have allowed that. So afterwards, with his cheap hot shot, hot shot camera, he shot the path through which the bodies were carried, carried to the graveyard and located the particular grave. In his own language, if one day somebody comes looking for any of the, these boys, then maybe with the help of this archive, they could at least locate the grave of their dear ones. These are not templated images. They don't look familiar to us. And thus, they don't even look significant. But these mundane images of spaces have preserved and kept buried some deep memories of bodies. Thank you. Comme on est à l'Alliance française, je veux deux, deux, trois petits mots en français, ce qui ne paraît pas tout à fait inopportun, monsieur, parfois. Euh, m- m- merci à tous ceux qui ont organisé ce symposium. Bon. Euh, évidemment, euh, Ra, mais euh, tous les gens euh, du centre culturel, tous les gens de l'ambassade. Euh, c'est, c'est, un beau, c'est un beau projet, c'est un, d'autant plus un, un, un beau projet que peu de gens dans le monde ont pensé à rendre hommage à, à cette invention, qui est celle de Nieps. Uh, the ongoing proliferation of photography festivals, the world over begs the question, what are uh, they all for? What function do they serve in the new economic system of photography? They continue to multiply in a period of economic crisis at a time when a great majority of photographers are struggling to make a living. Photography has many facing. It's an open and modern place where production and exchange can be vast and uncontrolled. It's also a place where true rarity can exist. The new festivals are often organized by photographers themselves. They are intended to provide an alternative to the various channels that are currently taking over photography. Time is the enemy. Technology, public taste, the market, and so on, all develop as their own place. The profession is losing all control and being left behind by the decision makers. At least one illusion remains that of retaining the public interest and esteem. As a result, festivals are being seen as a solution to the overlapping in this equation, but the following contradiction is inevitable. Festival organizers 
um, nostalgic for a golden age of photography that never was, seeing the economic salvation of the sectors lies in the promotion of the author photographer. The ultimate transformation of photography into an art form is intended to raise the horizon of a ruined landscape. However, by definition, the market detests dissemination and mass culture. In attempting to represent a blend between popular art and its insertion in the art world, photography puts itself in a schizophrenic position at best. So it's not surprising that what predominates, predominates in the spirit of the era of era is competition. Photographic institutions are equally guilty. Festivals aspire above all to being the biggest, the worst biggest photojournalism festival, the biggest underwater photography festival, the biggest food photography festival. This ambition can only be effective if the festival in question has a consequential amount to spend on communication and advertising. However, the overall drop in grant funding and revenue puts a limit on press invitations and receptions that include all and sundry. A festival lacking in, inter in entertainment funds is not a festival. It desires what it does not have. It can be compared to those humans who cannot bear to be who they are or how they should be. Just providing a coherent view of the state of photography is not enough to make them happy. Thus, we are faced with the supreme aberration when it comes down to it, festivals choose to invite journalists instead of the photographers themselves. In this toxic situation, it's better to reward the communicator than the producer. The economy photography would appear to be cannibalistic in nature. <laughs> the invention of the author. All photographs have a story. They don't fall from the sky. They owe nothing to absolute reality. They don't come from nowhere and, more to the point, don't have lives of their own. As objects, they are conferred with a destiny by men, their appetites and conflicts. The qualities attributed to communal, mechanical images have no magical aspect. Nothing predisposes them to become iconic, fetishized, or vintage. I, however, when the taste of some crosses over with the interests of certain social groups, a few well-chosen images find themselves invested with all possible values. They are then free to join the sacred ground of a certain history of photography. They can then access the li limited editions of objects worthy of inclusion in big public or private collection. The history of photography since Beaumont New World is nothing more than a, than a revision of the foundation of photography, a system of convents. <coughs> the methodology of this operation is aimed at denying the mechanical nature of the object and ignoring the fact that it is a mass worldwide product. The notions of author and style borrowed from art history have taken over. The vintage effect. Over time, albeit a short period of time, in less time than it took to be invented, photography went from being a technical curiosity to being a work of art and more recently an object of prestige. The early enthusiastic descriptions of emerging processes were replaced by terminal, terminology taken from the fine art. Artistic photography took on the term vintage. A beautiful shot is judged on its model, vigor, finesse, precision, transparency, smoothness, exceptional format, and above all, its rarity. 
the same. No notice is taken of the fact that Nisafar Niab's very invention is one of reproduction and is an act of copying, like all historic U-turns photography that was not invented to make art unless to reproduce and spread it is now an integral part of the aesthetic culture of the dominant West. It's now part of the range of contemporary co-representations incarnating modernity that exists in opinion-leading urban areas, a world where the cult of photographic beauty is limited to a circle of insiders who state in terms of decorations that one can guess at in the background no longer relies on the big companies of yore. It has no longer the case that the possession of works of art means one is part of the historical continuity of culture as no ledge. The only model the photograph collector has is the modern museum. One must now enter into the possession of a representative range of pieces that have been declared to be works of art and that, as such, are slotted into the category of graphic art or painting. In the case of the latter, the collector of contemporary pieces shifts, evolving in a private space where he or she exhibits their membership of a class, but not their taste of her or erudition. In both cases, the piece, as this is the crux, the crux of the issue, is detached from the original context that provided the framework for its possible meanings. It's kept and exhibited solely for its aesthetic value, in other words, consensual value. As it must be said that one of the art market's most successful exploits has been to bring together all of the varied and diverse production photography under the common umbrella term vintage, old, scientific, sport, reportage, and contemporary photography included. These diverse practices all come up against the same conditions in the market. They are graded on a value scale where the formal quality of the work of art and the capacity to recognize it as such are at the top of the scale. The interest of the picture are the, 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 the notices, the price. In photography today, Technical notions, historical research, and understanding intention have been relegated to the sidelines of an activity that involves conspicuous spending, acquiring vintage pieces. This leave us, leaves us with a beautiful and definitive paradox. In the end, only the illiterate, naive, or virginal is qualified to fill the work. The revisionist operation that reduces the photograph to the status of objects for sale means that photography no longer belongs to the domain of man's communication. Walter Benjamin understood the issue well when he, when he pointed out the following contradiction. The interior, the interior is the place of refuge for art. The collector was the true inhabitant of the interior. He transformed objects to own them, it's a task of Sisyphus. By possessing things, he must strip them of their commodity character. The apparition of photography on the art market is merely the consequence of the obvious need of a social class that, by extending the field of the artwork, imposes its increasing cultural and intellectual domination by impoverishing the object's significations. For this, the process of creation of the collectible object of the vintage piece 
relies of, on the principle of having to impose an idea of rarity. Of course, this type of rarity needs to be organized. The process is difficult, as though, as how do we explain, faced with an object that comes from an economy of reproduction, that its value depends on a limited number of prints. The role of the negative, its function as a matrix and the origin of the print must constantly be denied at, as it becomes the only and unique object of contemplation. This system presupposes the organization of, square, of scarcity. For all the images, this means managing, managing stocks and for contemporary pieces, limiting productions and certifying the numbers of prints. The status of author that is conferred on the photographer is the capital step in the process of legitimizing the object of prestige. And the role of conferring this status falls to the museums and critics in order to create moments of institutionalization of merchandise. Auctions are but the logical consequence of the transformations of a recognized piece into a luxury product. They give free reign to ego battles within the elite in a confrontation in which states and the capacity to sacrifice wealth manifest themselves simultaneously. The sale of vintage photographs in public auctions is a privileged space where rare shoes are on show and where the transformation of utility into meaning takes place. So, it's not surprising therefore to see that these big sales of renowned collections are also high society events. Finally, what we are dealing with in photography, with its sales and overinflated values, is but a modern form of potlatch, a ceremony whereby the exchange of prestigious goods takes over the longevity of power, the festive destruction of considerable, considerable sums in order to reinforce social position. The photography markers is thus but an efficient mechanism that pushes for the transformations of previously disdained objects into prestige pieces, pieces in order to extend the domain of rare, go rare goods. The exchange technique to impose those new objects could not exist without the corresponding community of interest, the collision between dealers, critics, curators, and collectors at the center of these intellectual and financial manipulations. Thanks. Thank you so much uh, for what were very provocative uh, papers. I'm going to open it out to audience questions right away. Um, so we'll take the first question and then we can have comments as well. Well, I think one of the things that all of you spoke about was uh, the impossibility of sh ascribing a particular meaning to the image, um, the photograph really, the photograph as image or the photograph as object. Um, the impossibility of imagining the photograph as a record perhaps and also denying it its um, you know value as romance and for me that was interesting and i think uh, while a lot of us felt uh, reprimanded Francois, um, by your paper the question of commerce the question of financing um, the spaces in between which images circulate how they are bought what is shown what is not shown the conditions in which they are shown were stated in a way that they're not often enough, I think. Um, and that for me was extremely valuable. It's not a question really, but just to say uh, to Madhushri that I really liked what you did with the pre-annotation on the Kashmir images. I think it was important even for someone like me uh, who has uh, engaged with representation in Kashmir. Uh, I wanted to connect that with something in the first quote that Latika put up as a provocation, which ends by saying, dismembered bodies don't sell papers. I actually beg to di disagree. Uh, one of the caveats that I made when I first went to Kashmir as a photographer was that I told the team I was working with, which was uh, a, a team which wish to speak to women and understand their experience of the conflict situation was that I would not photograph 
wounds or images of torture because in fact the image field of Kashmir was saturated by dead bodies and what that led to was closure. What that led to was a distancing between the dead figure, the wailing woman, and you as an ordinary citizen of India who anyway were a patriot, etc., etc. So the images that we produced were images, ordinary images of women speaking about their strategies of survival, of maintaining compassion from a very wide range of subject positions because it is also, uh, a, there's a homogenizing that happens through mass media representation. To add to this, when I, uh, this is hearsay, but apparently Xerox, the corporation, bought the entire visual archive of World War II and they removed all the dead bodies. Yeah, I mean, uh, of course, I mean, um, Sontag uh, warned us uh, um, to two decades earlier before it happened. And again, if the, again, the, if the bodies are out from the World War um, uh, documentation, that will pose again another, another set of uh, questions. So the, this pre-annotating and post-annotating, I think it, it needs to be kept as alive and as open as practicing photography itself. You only ask a few questions. <laughs> no. no, I mean, just as a comment um, um, about what Shiva said, and I think it is a shifting sort of uh, pendulum between how much horror to show and how much to not make visible and in what conditions those choices are made. Um, uh, recently, I mean, of course, with the, um, the use of pellet guns uh, in Kashmir, um, they were very graphic images, and these were images that were being smuggled out um, on two social media sites, uh, not so much in newspapers and mainstream media. Um, a lot of the uh, user accounts were being shut down if, um, you know, images which were deemed too graphic by whoever decides that things are too graphic uh, on something like Facebook, user accounts were shut down, um, images were censored, removed. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that sometimes um, one needs to see what is going on. Of course, then drawing, deciding where to draw the line between, let's say, uh, the war porn, um, you know, in the manner that poverty porn is played out again and again and again in photographs. Um, simultaneously, there was this uh, campaign that was apparently done by two lawyers in Pakistan where they photoshopped images of uh, Modi, Shah Rukh Khan, Virat Kohli, Eshwarya Rai, Amitabh Bachchan, and other celebrities. Um, and marked their faces um, with Photoshop, with pellet gun injuries, um, put bandages over their eyes. Extremely ineffective, extremely ridiculous uh, campaign that was, um, you know, uh, for me personally, and that went viral again, um, supposed to invoke some sort of, I mean, empathy, <laughs> impossible, even sympathy. Um, but you, there was Mark Zuckerberg in it. Mark Zuckerberg was, uh, you know, is the owner of Facebook, which is uh, complying with state policies of censorship. Modi is the one who is, um, uh, you know, what were these photoshopped images standing in for? And in that, then, the images of, of reality or of uh, what could be seen as uh, mutilated bodies uh, become important. They need to stand in for images of images. Um, to the extent that is required in contemporary political times as well. Okay, just one uh, last statement. Now, I have a question to you, uh, because you, uh, of course, that's the brief for this session also, yeah. that going viral. But you used that going viral um, some five times. Uh, yes, I during a, now, I, because we are also talking about archiving, so I want to say that how do we look at going vi uh, viral in the context of archiving? Does an image get archived if it goes viral? Or, uh, I mean, what is archiving practice mean in this era of going viral? I would, uh, I, I mean, and actually that stands, uh, I mean, is one of the uh, issues that you talk about in terms of changing technology. It's also one of the things Francois kind of uh, hinted at in terms of the question of rarity. Um, what is the access that people have to archives? What is the technology through which images are uh, stored, retained? Um, are they open for circulation? So the question of something becoming viral is entirely connected to the question of access as well. 
and reproduction, constant reproduction in technology. So Laura, would you like to comment on that? Yes, but I'll just add one question yeah. to that. Because go, when we say going viral, we don't only say the image going viral. And a particular emotion or a strategy or a campaign going viral, riding on the image. The image I means nothing. It's part of a campaign. So what gets archived then? Then, then the image gets completely framed within that virality? And yeah. if we locate this viral movement in the particular temporality produced by the sorts of forms of imaging and communication we have today, I would call it an archival process which occupies that kind of temporality and comments upon other kinds of temporality that other archives produce and in fact argues against the sort of preciousness that Francois is talking about, the, the sort of false preciousness created by limited editions, by rarity, etc., etc. There's so many different ways of approaching this question. I was thinking earlier when the question came up about the archive and the idea of trying to preserve something in longevity, you know, the rapidity of image making now is such that um, you know images come into being and then disappear, and even the going viral, you know things rise up and seem like a kind of explosion, and then the next week they're quickly forgotten. And the way that you know a provocative image like the you know drowned boy on the beach is so impactful for that you know what 24 hour, 48 hour, week long period, and then you know a month later or something else replaces it. And so one of the you know frustrations I think that I have as, a, as an artist is the way that photography um, uh, occupies a certain kind of space or you know imagination. But then what happens is it just seems to you know replicate and there's a kind of redundancy so that one image replicates another image replicates another image. And there's been so much discussion about becoming inured to provocative images or images that are controversial. And yet, on the other hand, I'm also struck by um, the problems when things aren't represented, like you know the war in Syria and the, the sort of uh, prohibition on journalists um, and on photography there, and the way that that has kept um, what's happening there so closed and so quiet compared to the way that when other uh, journalists are allowed into other war situations, then the world can hear about it. But um, I guess there's, you know, there's other questions about what it means to hold on to something forever, and do we need to have? Can we have access to all things that have ever been made all the time forever? And what does that even mean, or what does that look like? And you know, there was an idea with art that permanency had a value that you made something out of stone or out of marble, and it would last forever. But of course, marble doesn't last forever, and certainly photographs don't last forever. Or if they did last forever, what did what does it mean to look at? You know, even I showed my images today as a digital project projection. They're so far removed from like the object or from the experience. And one of my interests in photographing food was just trying to think about the palpability of eating. You know, for me, it's I, I also garden and I, I cook a lot. And so that the idea of having an experience where you eat a tomato that's freshly picked and you taste a piece of fruit that has, you know, been just eaten or um, there's a relationship with something that is not just visual, but it's experiential. And how do you how do you have that in a conversation? So it's not just images, because images removed from annotation or from historical context or from geographical context become something else. And so there's a kind of frustration that I feel like I try and deal with in my work. I think uh, we could look at it in another way that uh, the, the multiplicity of images is making us rethink this very abstract notion of, uh, you know, very, very estranging notion of uh, uh, from photography of archiving it. And uh, we could consider this as uh, uh, this, this era of so many images, which uh, in which I think images are just, the, the multiplicity is just becoming visible. You know, we have photographers whose works from the past, whose uh, film roles are are uh, are are still unex uh, undeveloped, you know, negatives which were never scanned, uh, which when which never became <coughs> visible. So uh, there are Polaroid images which are never seen the 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 light of day in public, and. So these are images which are 
which were never archived. So now this anxiety of archiving is uh, arriving at a stage when maybe photography should just be seen as revealing something, you know, uh, where annotation becomes redundant, you know, where virality is also where viral images are those, you know, uh, uh, cat taking photograph of, uh, of, you know, handing a camera where you don't need annotations. And it's a, so it's, it's a, it's a kind of very quick uh, virtual archiving that happens, which is called virality. And we could just see it as, you know, uh, we'll, we, we have to live with this situation of the world revealing or photography being used to reveal the world or to, to create its analogy. You know, mm -hmm. as uh, Kaya Silverman says. So this is the post-archival period we are living in. Rahab? Um, I'd just like to uh, think a little bit about, um, for a few minutes, the ubiquity of images and the value that one accords. And I'm not sure whether everything should be uh, posed on the question of an archive rather than of different collections of images. There's a difference between an archive and a collection, and maybe that's significant somewhere. Something that has semblance, perhaps, and something that is just operating on its own terms, if you give photography as a medium itself some agency. And this is why I wanted to actually draw Laura in a little bit um, to think about your still life images, and as you are a professor and so on and so forth, those are very private images, the still life ones, and they're sort of looking at your personal engagement with objects. And so there is a time now that everyone is looking at personal history having a kind of outer political resonance. Do you use them in your curricula? Are they very much part of uh, what you what you talk about or think about at the level of, of pedagogy? Um, do you mean my photographs in particular? Or, um, your own photos? Um, I, yes and no in the sense that uh, the thinking that leads into the making influences how I teach, but as a teacher, I'm um, not interested in having students replicate what it is that I do. I am interested in, um, again, this kind of negotiation between the so-called personal as a private, self-enclosed, self-generated thing um, as related to the social, because I think that there's, again, a kind of circuitry that happens between them, that the, that the public produces the private, and that you don't have, you know, they're they're really intertwined. Um, so I do encourage my students to consider issues of what is the personal, what is the private, where do, what, do, what do they think that something is beautiful, you know, um, the Renoir that was shown um, in your presentation, like why is that a beautiful image, whereas perhaps the Falkland Road image would be something that would be s scary for them or, you know, controversial or something. It's like, where, where do those suppositions come from? And so there's a lot of conversations about where attitudes um, and ideas and aesthetics and ethics um, are founded and how they're historically, again, and politically and ideologically grounded. So it is a part of how I teach. And I also teach students how to make things. I really think that there is um, a kind of learning from making and from being materially engaged. And I am, my own bias is there's a kind of frustration or um, a concern about the facility of image making because there, it's so easy to make images. Um, and I wonder again whether this is a revelation or whether it's a replication um, because of you know the number of images that students make that look exactly like all the other images that have been made in the world, and so what that process is, like where those ideas come from. I think we'll close for lunch, and we're back here at what time? Two thirty. Okay, two thirty for the third session. <laughs>